Good morning or afternoon or however. Um, this is Miss Dennison and I am going to be recording chapter 19. This is the nursing management of pregnancy at risk, pregnancy related complications. Um, the Healthy People 2030, um, two of the or some of the objectives for healthy people um, is to reduce severe maternal complications of pregnancy identified during labor and delivery hospitalizations. Um, this will reduce perinatal morbidity and mortality and optimize pregnancy outcomes. Also, their objective is to reduce preterm births as this will help preserve the health and well-being of the growing fetus if the pregnancy goes to term. These are some terminology that you'll need to know. So the maternal mortality rate, this is the number of maternal deaths. So this is the number of mom deaths per 100,000 live births in the USA. So in 2007, um, I'm, I'm sorry, in 2010, there were 21 women out of 100,000 who died. So in 2020, there were 23.8 deaths. I'm not really sure where the 0.8 comes in, but you know, here we are, um, per 100,000 live births. Uh, and so as you can see, that maternal mortality rate has increased. So um, that is definitely an, an objective that uh, ways nurses need to, need to work on. So the infant mortality rate is the number of deaths of infants younger than one year of age per 1,000 live births. So in 2010, there were 6.12 deaths and out of 1,000. In 2020, there were 5.4. So it's actually decreased, which is fantastic. <clears throat> The neonatal mortality rate is the number of deaths of infants younger than 28 days of age per 1,000 live births. So in 2019, it was 3.73, and in 2021, it was 3.52. So that is also trending downward. Um, the perinatal mortality rate, that's the number of stillbirths plus the number of neonatal deaths per 1,000 live births. This actually can be an indicator of the quality of healthcare before, during, and after delivery. So this is extremely important as well. <clears throat> so some of the causes of maternal death in the USA, um, cardiovascular disease, infection, sepsis, non-cardiovascular diseases such as ectopic pregnancy, which is actually the leading cause of the first trimester deaths. <clears throat> And then morbidity, there's no real surveillance method that's available to measure that, um, but it does result in a high-risk pregnancy. And the causes of neonatal deaths, congenital anomalies are the leading cause. So pregnancy should be viewed as a normal process with positive outcomes. Women considered to be at high risk have a higher morbidity and mortality compared with mothers in the general population. One in four pregnant women is considered to be at high risk or diagnosed with complications. So one in four um, is always going to have a higher morbidity and mortality compared to other mothers. Risk means different things to different people. Um, basically, it is defined as pregnancy in which the life or health of the mother or fetus is jeopardized by a disorder coincidental with or unique to pregnancy. Um, it can be designated as high risk for any of the several undesirable outcomes, um, patient at risk for utero placental insufficiency, the gradual decline in delivery of needed substances by placenta to fetus, carry a serious threat for fetal growth restriction, intrauterine fetal death, interpartum fetal distress, and various types of fetal morbidity. Um, high 
high risk status will always extend through the postpartum period. So that's four to six weeks after birth. So it all goes together. Categories of risk, so biophysical. Um, these factors uh, originate within the patient or the fetus and affect developmental development and functioning of either one or both. So these are genetic considerations, so defective genes, um, ABO incompatibility, chromosomal abnormalities, large fetal size, nutritional status, which is one of the most important determinants of pregnancy outcome. This includes a young age, so the young age of the mom, three pregnancies in previous two years, and it happens, substance abuse, inadequate dietary intake, inadequate or excessive weight gain, and if the hematocrit is less than 33%. Um, medical and obstetric disorders complications of current and past pregnancies, OB-related illnesses, and pregnancy losses. So those are the biophysical. Now the psychosocial, um, these are maternal behaviors and adverse lifestyles that have negative effects on the health of the patient and fetus. So smoking, um, this leads to low birth weight infants, higher neonatal mortality rates, and increased rates of um, premature rupture of membranes. <clears throat> this is actually increased by low socioeconomic status, poor nutritional status, and concurrent use of alcohol. Now also we have caffeine. So if mom consumes greater than 200 milligrams per day, which is a 12 ounce cup of coffee, this may be an um, increased risk for intrauterine growth restriction infants. Alcohol, there has never been a safe intake estimation. Um, it can result in fetal alcohol syndrome, fetal alcohol encephalopathy, learning disabilities, and hyperactivity. Um, this is something that you definitely need to be educating moms on. Drugs can be teratogenic, cause metabolic disturbances, produce chemical effects or cause depression or alteration of central nervous system function. And this includes all drugs, um, no matter what. Psychologic status um, or considerations. Uh, the, this is the relationship between emotional distress and birth complications um, includes specific interest psychic disturbances and addictive lifestyles. If there is a history of child or spouse abuse, inadequate support systems, family disruption or dissolution, maternal role changes or conflicts, non-compliance with cultural norms, um, unsafe cultural, ethnic, or religious practices. So sociodemographic um, issues, these arise from mother and her family. It may place the, fit, the patient and the fetus at risk. So low income, poverty, um, this basically leads to inadequate financial resources for food and prenatal care, poor general health, uh, increased risk of medical complications of pregnancy, and a greater prevalence of adverse environmental influences. Also, this increases their risk of lack of prenatal care um, and failure to diagnose and treat early is a major risk factor. Um, basically, it can be due to financial barriers, lack of access to care, um, depersonalization of the system resulting in long waits. So if they are on you know, a government assistant program, people can be very prideful and they don't want people to know that um, they are poor or less fortunate. Um, also, they may have a lack of understanding of the need for early and continued care <clears throat> or cultural beliefs that do not support the need or fear of the healthcare system. <clears throat> now age, 
um, both ends of the spectrum have increased risk of poor outcomes. Um, if the age is greater than 30 or less than 15, um, these complications can include anemia, <coughs> pregnancy-induced hypertension, prolonged labor um, due to that smaller pelvis and the younger uh, and the younger girls, um, long-term social implications. Uh, can be lower income, increased dependency on government support programs, higher divorce rates, and higher parity, um, which parity is the number of previous pregnancies associated with age and includes all first pregnancy, pregnancies, especially at either end of the childbearing age continuum. Um, once the mom is identified as high risk, the patient and the fetus will be monitored carefully throughout the remainder of the pregnancy. Um, all patients who undergo antipartal um, issues are at risk for real and potential problems and may feel anxious. In the third trimester, they're more concerned about protecting themselves and their fetus and consider themselves most vulnerable to outside influences. Um, and when they are labeled high risk, often this increases this sense of vulnerability. At-risk pregnancies can also affect parental attachment, um, accomplishment of tasks of pregnancy, and family adaptation to pregnancy. Families may become frustrated because they cannot engage in activities that prepare them for parenthood. Um, so as the nurse, you can help the patient and the family regain control and balance. Um, you're going to provide support, encouragement, give any info about pregnancy, any problems, its management, um, and opportunities to make as many choices as possible about the patient's care. These are just a few of the um, critical problems um, for medical and for nursing care, but the emphasis is on safe birth of normal infants who can develop to their full potential. Um, diagnosis of these uh, high risk issues imposes a situational crisis on the family. Um, they can be worried about loss of pregnancy before the anticipated date, development of gestational diabetes with its potential complications, um, also a birth of a neonate that doesn't meet cultural, societal, or familial norms or expectations. <clears throat> so a woman dies in pregnancy or childbirth every minute of every day. And the biggest killer is obstetric hemorrhage. But these are some of the complications um, that can happen in pregnancy on this slide. The most common cause of vaginal bleeding <coughs> in reproductive age women is pregnancy. Um, actually, this can be potentially life-threatening. Um, often, it is the nurse's responsibility to make that initial assessment of vaginal bleeding. So, in a miscarriage, also, um, it is called a spontaneous abortion. Um, also, they can have an incompetent cervix um, with a premature dilation of the cervix, a hyatidiform hi mole, which is false conception. We'll talk about that later. <coughs> and conditions causing late pregnancy bleeding um, can be placenta previa and abrupto placentae. That usually occurs after the 20th week of gestation. So a spontaneous abortion is a major cause of bleeding during the first and the second trimesters. Um, and it is the most common complication of early pregnancy. <clears throat> it is a pregnancy that ends as a result of natural causes before viability, which is considered less than 20 weeks gestation. 
the incidence is 10 to 15 percent of all clinically recognized pregnancies. Most occur before eight weeks and 50 percent result from chromosomal abnormalities. A stillbirth is a loss of a fetus after the 20th week of pregnancy and can occur right up to the time of labor and delivery. And these occur in one out of a hundred pregnancies. It's actually very common. Um, and you may actually see the, this in clinical. Um, I'm 90% sure you probably will. Um, so causes of early spontaneous abortions, again, 50% are genetic <coughs> abnormalities, um, but includes endocrine disorders, so luteal phase defects, hypothyroidism, uncontrolled um, diabetes, <coughs> I'm sorry, immunologic factors, um, systemic disorders such as lupus, and genetic factors that are usually unrelated to the mom. Infection is not a common cause, but um, it does increase the risk of varicella. Now, late spontaneous abortion causes are more likely related to mom's conditions. Um, this can include advanced maternal age and parity, uh, premature cervical dilation, hypothyroidism, cervical insufficiency, reproductive tract abnormalities, um, inadequate nutrition, tobacco and caffeine use, illegal drug use, um, also acute infections such as thrombophilia, I'm sorry, such as rubella, CMV, HSV, uh, BV, which is bacterial vaginosis, toxoplasmosis, uh, PCOS, lupus, hypertension, chronic nephritis, diabetes, obesity, and stressful life events. So those are more um, mom related. <coughs> Clinical manifestations uh, include uterine bleeding, uterine contractions, and uterine pain. First trimester spontaneous abortions may have may have at home without surgery, but need serial HCG levels frequently to validate that all the tissues have been expelled. Second trimester um, spontaneous abortions need hospitalization and augmented labor and delivery. It's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. Um, so. When mom is bleeding, she must be seen ASAP by the provider. Um, they will de they were, will report varying degrees of vaginal bleeding, low back pain, abdominal cramping, and passage of products of conception tissue. As the nurse, you're going to ask the um, about the color. If it's bright red, that's that's significant, and the amount. So how often is she changing pads? Um, Saturation of one pad is very significant, and that means that she is bleeding a lot. Um, instruct her to save any clots or tissue that is passed and bring that with her. Um, also, remain calm. <clears throat> so, a threatened um, spontaneous abortion. This is unexplained slight vaginal bleeding early in pregnancy cervix is closed, um, there may be mild cramping or backache or pelvic pressure, um, but there is no passage of fetal tissue. <clears throat> this is usually managed at home. Um, bed rest is advised but does not prevent progression to the actual spontaneous abortion. Follow-up treatment depends on if those symptoms progress or subside and if pregnancy remains intact. So you want to avoid hospitalization. Clearly, we all want to avoid hospitalization, um, but need to watch for heavy bleeding and infection. And approximately half of these pregnancies continue. Um, so it doesn't necess necessarily mean it's going to happen. Um, it's diagnosed by a vaginal ultrasound to concern, confirm if the sac is empty. Um, declining maternal serum, HCG, and progesterone levels. Um, that will give you more information about the viability. <clears throat> now, an inevitable abortion, um, mom's going to have moderate to heavy bleeding with an open cervical oz. 
tissue may be present with bleeding, cramping is mild to severe, um, often accompanied by rupture of membranes and cervical dilation. They have more abdominal pain than a backache and expulsion of the fetus is inevitable. Um, it's diagnosed by ultrasound and HCG levels <coughs> indicating pregnancy loss. Um, the treatment is vacuum curatage if products of conception are not passed. Prostaglandin analogs such as misoprostol also can be used to empty the uterus of the retained tissue because remember you've got to get rid of all that tissue because it can kill you. Um, an incomplete abortion, um, mom will have moderate to heavy to profuse bleeding with an open cervical oz. Tissue may be present with bleeding. Um, she'll have severe cramping, also an expulsion of the fetus with retention of the placenta. The uterus is usually smaller than expected for gestational age and will not be firm. And these usually require a DNC or a prostaglandin analog as well. A complete abortion <clears throat> is the passage of all products of conception. Um, she'll have slight vaginal bleeding, um, mild cramping may be present, the uterus is contracted, and the cervical oz is closed. The uterus, again, is usually smaller than expected for gestational age, and no intervention is needed as everything has passed. So complete, everything has passed, does it need intervention? A missed abortion is um, a non-viable embryo retained in utero for at least six weeks. Um, the fetus will die in utero, but is not expelled. The uterine growth will cease and is smaller than expected. <clears throat> she will not have uterine contractions. Um, she may have brownish vaginal discharge, a closed cervix. Um, if the fetus is retained beyond four weeks, um, fetal autolysis, which is the breakdown of cells or tissue, um, results in the release of thromboplastin and DIC could ensue. Um, usually management results in the eventual um, spontaneous abortion in 16 to 76 percent. If the first if it's in the first trimester, suction curatage. If it's in the second trimester, usually a DNC. Labor will be induced um, with intravaginal PGE2, prostaglandin, mis misoprostol, um, a suppository to empty that uterus without cervical intervention. Habitual abortion is a recurrent abortion um, occurring consecutively in three or more pregnancies. Um, parental chromosomal abnormalities is the possible cause. <clears throat> There's no cause um, identified in 50% of these. 60 to 70% go on to have successful pregnancies um, in the future with no treatment. Chances of successful pregnancy will decline with each succeeding abortion. Um, also can be caused by reproductive tract abnormalities, chronic diseases, or immunologic problems. Also an incompetent cervix. Um, a septic abortion is a pre the presence of infection. This is very rare. Bleeding may be slight to heavy and is usually malodorous. Um, mom will have a fever and abdominal tenderness, and um, this can occur with prolonged labor and unrecognized rupture of membranes. <clears throat> also, um, it can be caused by criminal attempts to terminate the pregnancy, because that is a real thing. Management depends on the type of miscarriage or spontaneous abortion, and of course the signs and symptoms. Um, traditionally, a threatened abortion has been managed at home, um, but it doesn't necessarily prevent, bed rest doesn't necessarily prevent progression 
to the spontaneous abortion. Um, if all products of the conception are passed, there's no surgical intervention. If she is having heavy bleeding, excessive cramping, um, that tissue, the remaining embryonic uh, fetal or placental tissue must be removed, usually by suction curatage. <clears throat> if the patient is stable, um, expected management, most um, will end in uh, spontaneous abortion. Usually they are discharged home in a couple of hours if her vitals are stable. Um, if the bleeding is minimal and she has recovered from anesthesia. As the nurse, you're going to be doing pad counts, um, documentation of passage of placental tissue, pain level, um, just being there for her, you know, having having that presence, um, education, explanations, preparations. Um, also, you may be doing ultrasounds, um, blood work, usually serial hema, <clears throat> HCG levels, progesterone levels, H and H levels, white blood count levels. Um, also, medications, maybe the prostaglandin, um, mesoprostol or Cytotec, that's usually given orally or vaginally. Um, and it's usually effective in completing that abortion within seven days. Also, mefestoprone, which is the RU486. Um, also, induction of labor with PGE2, such as Cervidil, Prepidil gel, and Prostin E2. Um, you're going to be monitoring her for signs and symptoms of nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, um, given Rogam to mom um, if she is RH negative within 72 hours after the abortion is complete. A DNC um, may be completed. The cervix is dilated and suction curatage is inserted to scrape the uterine walls and remove that uterine content. <clears throat> After evacuation, oxytocin is often given to prevent hemorrhage. Um, so, of course, general pre-op and post-op care is appropriate um, and identification of the underlying cause of the abortion. So, this is um, just a picture of the uh, DNC. Um, <clears throat> so post miscarriage care, if she is having excessive bleeding, um, ergo products such as meth methylergonavine or methergine or prostaglandin such as carboprost or hemabate may be given, that's going to contract that uterus and help to expel that tissue. Um, Antibiotics given as necessary to prevent infection. Analgesics such as NSAIDs can be given to decrease comfort. Um, psychological aspects of care will focus on what pregnancy loss means to the patient and family. Um, make sure that you are providing explanation regarding the nature of the abortion, expected procedures, and possible future implications. Um, also, this is important, um, mom needs to be offered the option of actually seeing the products of conception. Um, and you may need to explain to mom what the facility does with the products of conception. So. Um, Asking her if she wants to see them may actually help her to obtain closure um, and psychologically, you know, sometimes that's just the way that you got to do. Um, Follow-up follow care at home after a DNC, um, again, they're usually DC'd within a few hours or as soon as vital signs are stable. Um, emphasize her need for rest. If there is, has been a significant blood loss, um, she may need iron supplementation. Teach her about the expected signs and symptoms that she's going to be experiencing, um, cramping, 
type and amount of bleeding, when she can resume sexual activity, family planning. Um, she, mom may ask when she can get pregnant again. <clears throat> you should counsel her about the importance of completely resolving the loss before attempting another pregnancy. Um, definitely encourage follow-up care um, to assess the physical and emotional recovery. Also, referrals to local support groups can be provided. There's some great, great places um, that are local that that are amazing with these moms. And follow-up phone calls are very important, especially on the due date of the pregnancy. This provides opportunity for patients to ask questions, seek advice, and to receive info to help process that grief. Because it's a mom that does not have a baby. So they are gonna grieve that, even though they didn't know the baby, even though all those things, it's still a huge, huge loss. So be very, very gentle. Week 13, again, mom may want to see. She may want to hold the, ba the, the, the baby. So an ectopic pregnancy is any pregnancy in which the fertilized ovum implants outside of the uterus. <clears throat> this could happen in the fallopian tubes, the cervix, the ovaries, the intestines, and the abdominal cavity. Um, it draws the blood supply from the site of the abnormal implantation and it can rupture organs due to size. It can lead to massive hemorrhage, infertility, or death. It occurs uh, one in every 50 pregnancies, so roughly 2%. Um, the incidence has increased fourfold in the last 30 years and accounts for 10% of maternal mortality in the U.S. A ruptured ectopic pregnancy is a medical emergency. <clears throat> So risk factors for these, um, tubal scarring from pelvic inflammatory disease, um, gonorrhea and chlamydia can attack the fallopian tubes, producing silent infections, um, which can increase the incidence. Um, previous tubal surgery, infertility, uh, pelvic inflammatory disease, previous pregnancy loss, um, that's induced or spontaneous. Um, previous ectopic pregnancy, uterine fibroids, sterilization, smoking also can alter tubal mobility, um, so that can be a risk factor. <clears throat> History of multiple sexual partners, um, use of progestin only, oral contraceptives, douching, and exposure to diethyls, DES, I don't know how to say that. Symptoms, most are diagnosed before rupture based on the three most classic symptoms that occur. Um, this usually occurs six to eight weeks after last menstrual period. Um, so she will have abdominal pain. Um, it begins as dull lower quadrant pain on one side, um, which can progress to colicky pain as the tube stretches. Um, it progresses to diffuse, constant, severe pain that is generalized throughout the lower abdomen. Also, delayed menses of one to two weeks or lighter than usual or an irregular period. Also, abnormal vaginal bleeding or spotting. Um, you'll see mild to moderate, dark red, or brown intermittent. <sighs> and that's due to sloughing of the decidua of the uterus. Only about half of the women will present with all three symptoms. Um, you may see <clears throat> a tender abdomen, painful vaginal exam, cervical motion tenderness, and possible adnexal mass. Most with early diagnosis can be treated with methotrexate, single IM injection. Um, to be eligible for this, mom must be stable, no signs of active bleeding in the peritoneal cavity. Um, 
she should have low HCG levels, so less than 5,000, and um, the mass should, it has to measure less than four centimeters and it has to be unruptured. So methotrexate is a folic acid antagonist that inhibits cell division in the developing embryo. Actually, it's usually used as a chemotherapeutic agent. Um, now, if it is not diagnosed until after the rupture, um, she may have referred shoulder pain from blood that is irritating that subdiaphragmatic phrenic nerve. Um, she may have generalized one-sided or deep lower quadrant acute abdominal pain. That can be sudden or severe. Um, she may have signs and symptoms of shock. Um, that is inconsistent with the amount of vaginal bleeding because the bleeding is inside instead of outside. Um, vasomotor disturbances, um, adnexal tenderness and mass, a rigid tender abdomen due to blood irritating the peritoneum, um, low H and H levels, and increased leukocytes. Um, only the uterus is designed to expand to accommodate fetal development. So if that ha if the um, if it has implanted say on the colon or the stomach or pancreas or, or whatever you can see how severe this can be. <clears throat> um, risk factors are history of STDs, pelvic inflammatory disease, infection and damage, IUDs, um, endometriosis, previous ectopic congenital anomalies of the tube, multiple induced abortions, and tubal reversal. So the chance of fetal survival in abdominal pregnancy will depend on gestational age. The risk for fetal deformity in the abdominal pregnancy is high as a result of pressure deformities caused by oligohydramnios. This is just a, a picture of where it can land. A tubal ectopic pregnancy, um, the key to early detection is having a high index of suspicion for that condition. Every patient with abdominal pain, vaginal spotting, or bleeding and positive pregnancy tests should undergo screening for an ectopic pregnancy. Um, the most important screening tools are beta HCG levels and transvaginal ultrasound. Um, HCG levels will be redrawn every 48 hours to determine if the pregnancy is viable. And you can sometimes see an ectopic on an ultrasound. <coughs> so you're going to assess for presence of active bleeding, vertigo, shoulder pain, hypotension, tachycardia, um, the vaginal exam is done only once and very cautiously um, as the mass may rupture and you do not want it to rupture. So medical management, uh, methotrexate to dissolve the tubal pregnancy. Um, again, she has to be hemodynamically stable. Best results if the mass is unruptured and less than 3.5 centimeters. Um, if no cardiac activity is noted on the ultrasound and if the serum beta HCG level is less than 5,000. Mom must be willing to comply with post-treatment lifestyle restrictions and monitoring <coughs> as she will have to come in and um, do blood work and be assessed very, very often. Um, this will avoid surgery and it is a safe, effective, and cost-effective way um, to manage these atopic pregnancies. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, you can let the woman know that uh, the drug metabolite 
is contained in the urine um, and it can be considered toxic for approximately 72 hours after receiving the methotrexate. The levels are highest during the first eight hours after treatment. Um, make sure you educate mom to avoid getting urine on the toilet seat and to double flush the toilet with the lid down after urinating. Also explain that her stools may contain residual drug for up to seven days. So nursing management, preparation for treatment, analgesics, medications for medical treatment, teaching of rupture, surgery. Um, a linear salpingostomy is done to preserve the tube. <clears throat> it's left open to heal by secondary intention because it results in less scarring. But if it's ruptured, um, she will have to have a salpingectomy, which is the removal of the tube. Um, <clears throat> also monitoring HCG levels until it's less than five. That usually takes two to three weeks, but it can take six to eight weeks to completely resolve. Um, monitor for shock, maintain hydration, um, maintain bed rest, provide com comfort measures, no aspirin as you don't want to increase that risk for rupture or bleeding. Um, and contraceptive management for at least three menstrual cycles. Um, and also referral to grief counseling or infertility support groups as needed can be important. So gestational trophoblastic disease. The WHO classification of gestational trophoblastic disease includes disorders of placental development, so hydatiform hi hi mole, and neoplasms of the trophoblast, or choriocarcinoma. Um, they produce HCG. Um, neoplastic disorders that originate in the placenta, gestational tissue is present but not viable. Um, there is a higher incidence of this in Asian countries. So trophoblast cells form the outer layer of the blastocyst and provide nutrients to the embryo. They develop into a large part of the placenta and are the first cells to differentiate from the fertilized egg. <clears throat> so a trophoblastic proliferative disorder um, without a viable fetus the most common type is a hydatiform mole, um, which can be partial or complete. A complete classic mole contains no fetal tissue, develops from an egg which has no nucleus, so it contains no genetic material or inactivated. Haploid sperm fertilizes the egg and duplicates before the first cell division, so it has 46 um, X chromosomal set of totally paternal origin. Um, also, it's possible for the empty egg to be fertilized by two normal sperm, um, and it has the ability to invade the wall of the uterus. A complete mole is associated with the development of choriocarcinoma. This is a virulent cancer with metastasis to other organs. Um, the first symptoms of choriocarcinoma in 80% of cases are shortness of breath because it's, it's found so late. Um, usually by that time it has metastasized to the lungs. Um, usually mom will present with vaginal bleeding, anemia, excessively enlarged uterus, preeclampsia, and hyperemesis. A, partially, a partial mole is usually present with missed or incomplete abortion, um, vaginal bleeding, and a smaller normal sized for date uterus. The cause is usually unknown, but possibly genetic. Um, it usually tends to affect older women more often than younger women. A DNC is used to completely empty the uterus. Also, serial levels of HCG is used for one year to make sure that there is no trophoblastic tissue left. Um, 
the HCG levels will fall in normal cases, but because that's the reason that they do these serial levels is because if it rises, that means that the tissue is malignant. Um, also, a chest x-ray every six months, um, recommending mom to avoid pregnancy for one year, HCG levels weekly until undetectable for three weeks, then monthly for an entire year. So this resembles a bunch of white grapes. These hydropic or fluid-filled vesicles <clears throat> grow rapidly, causing the uterus to be larger than expected for gestational age. There's usually no embryo or fetus, placenta, amniotic membranes, or fluid. Maternal blood has no placenta to receive it, so hemorrhages into the uterine cavity and vaginal bleeding will occur. Um, a Let's see. Partial moles cause fewer signs and symptoms, um, so they may be mistaken for an incomplete or missed abortion. So basically, you have these fluid-filled vesicles instead of an embryo. So for the, um, in the early stages, it usually cannot be distinguished from a normal pregnancy. So mom may take a pregnancy test, think she's pregnant, have, just be all excited, um, you know, and then get to the doctor's office and, you know, find out that it's not an embryo at all. So it's, it's kind of, kind of, it's really sad. It's, it's very very depressing. Um, so there will be vaginal bleeding and 95%. It might be dark brown like prune juice or bright red. Could be scant to profuse. Um, the uterine will enlarge and uh, there, sh there will be anemia due to blood loss, excessive nausea, vomiting, high HCG levels, abdominal cramping or pain, caused by uterine distension. Passage of hydropic vesicles, frequently a vascular edematous villi. Preeclampsia in approximately 70%. Um, if diagnosed before 24 weeks, a molar pregnancy should be sus suspected and ruled out with, with preeclampsia. Um, hyperthyroidism is also a complication. Um, and usually the treatment of the molar pregnancy restores normal function. Cervical insufficiency is the premature dilation of the cervix. <clears throat> um, usually it's painless um, without evidence of uterine activity. Um, usually is found with early pregnancy bleeding and sometimes the cause of late miscarriage. Um, the traditional definition is a passive painless dilation of the cervix during the second trimester, <clears throat> um, but current thinking is the cervical competence is variable and exists as a continuum that is determined in part by cervical length. Um, factors can include composition of cervical tissue and individual circumstances associated with pregnancy such as stress and lifestyle. Usually occurs in the fourth or fifth month of gestation uh, before the point of fetal viability. The fetus dies unless the dilation can be arrested and it accounts for approximately 20 to 25 percent of second and third trimester losses. Um, exact etiology is not known. Previous cervical trauma, such as lacerations during childbirth, could be um, a possibility. Uh, excessive forced cervical dilation for curatage or biopsy or pregnancy termination. Um, congen a congenitally short cervix. Um, any anomalies of the cervix or the uterus, previous precipitous birth, a prolonged second stage of labor, 
increased amounts of relaxin and progesterone. Um, so this is actually treated with bed rest, pelvic rest, which means no sex, avoidance of heavy lifting, uh, progesterone supplementation, placement of a cervical pessary if needed, or surgical cervical cerclage procedure. So cervical funneling, um, this is basically diagnosed by an ultrasound, um, usually between 16 and 24 weeks to determine that cervix length. Shortening can occur from the internal eyes outward and can be viewed on the ultrasound as funneling. It's indicative of reduced cervical competence and may be um, accompanied by effacement. Best treatment is unknown. Basically, medical management, again, bed rest, pessaries, antibiotics, anti-inflammatories. Um, This is a cerclage procedure. Um, this was devised 50 years ago. Uh, the McDonald technique is usually done. So a heavy purse string suture secures and reinforces the internal eyes of the cervix. Um, usually a, a short cervix is ID'd at or after 20 weeks um, and no infection or chorioamnionitis is present. And then the decision to proceed with cerclage is made with caution um, because the risks are uh, suture displacement, rupture of membranes, and chorioamnionitis. So expect the woman, um, she'll have backache, pelvic pressure, and increased mucoid discharge. Um, she, we're gonna, we're gonna watch that uterine activity. <clears throat> that is gonna hopefully predict preterm birth. Um, assess patient's feelings about pregnancy, evaluate her support system, um, evaluate her reactions to stress, um, teach warning signs to watch for such as signs of preterm labor. This could be lower back pain, abdominal tightening, changes in vaginal discharge, rupture of membranes, and infection. So placenta previa means after birth burst. This typically presents with painless bright red vaginal bleeding um, during the second or third trimester. Usually it's not profuse usually it stasis spontaneously, but it will recur again. Um, usually they will start bleeding between uh, weeks 27 and 32. Um, this is basically where the placenta implants into the lower uterine segment um, such that it completely or partially covers the cervical eyes or close enough to cause bleeding when the cervix dilates or the lower uterine segment of faces. Um, it should implant in the upper portion. Um, in this, it implants in the lower portion. It's diagnosed by ultrasound, but cannot be accurately diagnosed until 28 weeks. Um, may be diagnosed before symptoms appear, and it is definitely a cause of late pregnancy bleeding. It increases with the rising number of C-sections, um, increasing maternal age, and more infertility treatment. Um, causes are endometrial scarring or damage in the upper section, um, such as suction curatage, multiparity, or DNC, also cocaine use. Um, the uteroplacental uh, underperfusion um, can increase the surface area required for placental attachment. This happens with smoking. Um, and usually diagnosis is made with painless vaginal bleeding after 20 weeks. Um, an ultrasound is used to rule out other causes of bleeding. Um, 
So also causes and risk factors, previous C-section, um, advanced maternal age, so greater than 35 to 40, um, the classifications, um, there's complete or total, that means the placenta, the placenta totally covers the eyes, marginal, so the edge of the placenta is 2.5 centimeters or closer to the internal cervical eyes, <clears throat> low lying, um, that's the that's when the exact relationship of the placental to the Oz has not been determined. Um, it has implanted in the lower segment of the uterus, but away from the Oz. And then incomplete or partial, um, the edge of the placenta only partially covers the Oz. So. Um, as the nurse, you're going to check that fetal status. Um, you want her abdominal exam. You want her to have a soft, relaxed, non-tender um, abdomen with a normal tone. Um, labs and such, CBC, blood type and RH factor, coagulation profile, type and cross match, ultrasound. Um, you'll see that with Previa. Here's you a picture, kind of shows you um, how that placenta has um, attached to or close to the Oz. <clears throat> now, vital signs actually can be normal even with heavy bleeding, remember, because the pregnant woman can lose up to 40% of her blood volume without showing signs and symptoms of shock. Um, the uterus should be soft and relaxed, <clears throat> non-tender. Um, the fundal height is often greater than expected in these, um, these moms. Uh, the fetus usually remains high due to the placenta in the low uterine segment. Maternal complications of this, hemorrhage, uh, C-section, anesthesia complications, transfusion reactions, and postpartum hemorrhage. Fetal complications, preterm birth, stillbirth, malpresentation, um, anemia, intrauterine growth restriction, small for gestational age, um, and possibly increased congenital anomalies. So management is expectant or active. It's active if it is at or greater than 36 weeks or excessive or persistent bleeding, or if the patient is in labor, then um, an immediate C-section is performed. An asymptomatic patient whose placenta lies greater than two centimeters from the cervical eyes can labor safely. Um, however, continuous maternal and fetal assessment needs to be done. Um, maintain bed rest, uh, count and weigh pads, no rectal or vaginal exams, period. Uh, prepare for surgery, possibly. Um, emotional support, very important, of course. Monitor for postpartum hemorrhage. Um, large vascular channels in the lower uterine segment may continue to bleed because of the diminished muscle content. And it lacks interlacing muscle bundled found in the upper portion of the uterus. Bleeding may occur even with a firmly contracted fundus. So expectant management, this is observation in bed rest if it's less than 36 weeks and the fetal heart rate is normal and the bleeding is mild. It's less than 250 milliliters. Um, she is gonna have um, lab studies. Uh, <clears throat> if, um, I'm sorry, again, no vaginal or rectal exams. Um, assess for bleeding, signs and symptoms of labor, um, 
monitor those uterine contractions. Um, IV needs to be in with a large bore needle, 16 to 18, just in case she has to go for a, um, an immediate C-section. Um, also, if um, it is less than 34 weeks, um, she is given betamethasone to help to uh, mature the fetus's lungs. Also, magnesium sulfate can be given if she's having uh, uterine contractions. Also, she may need a stool softener with a high fiber diet so she's not straining. Um, and that's all. So, placental abruption is the detachment of part or all of a normally implanted placenta from the uterine wall after the 20th week of gestation. This leads to bleeding and hematoma formation on the maternal side of the placenta. So as the clot expands, further separation occurs. Um, it also interferes with the placental fetal circulation. Um, classifications, you have grade one, which is mild. Um, that's minimal bleeding, less than 500 milliliters, only 10 to 20% separation. <clears throat> Maybe a tender uterus, um, no signs of shock, no fetal distress, minimal um, dark red vaginal bleeding, and a normal uterine tone. Now grade two is moderate. That's um, usually the bleeding is 1,000 to 1,500 milliliters, continuous abdominal pain, mom is in mild shock, um, may have tachycardia, she will have an increased uterine tone and uterine tenderness and pain and usually fetal distress. Grade three is severe. Um, this is absent to moderate dark red vaginal bleeding, more than 1500 milliliters, greater than 50% detachment, um, severe agonizing abdominal pain, uh, <clears throat> and sometimes the development of DIC. Classic manifestations, vaginal bleeding, port wine color, abdominal pain over one area or diffuse over uterus with a board-like abdomen. Um, may begin as aching or dull abdominal and low back pain, or it can be sudden, severe, and continuous. Um, bleeding may dissect or separate the membranes from the decidua, basalis, and flow out through the vagina. Um, this is in 70 to 80 percent, but it can remain concealed, um, which is retroplacental hemorrhage, or it could be both. Um, the clot is often attached to the posterior side of the placenta. Um, that uterus will not relax between contractions. Um, signs and symptoms of shock is greater than the apparent blood loss. Um, DIC happens in approximately 40% of large abruptions. Complications, um, cuvillar uterus, so the blood invades the myometrial tissue between the muscle fibers. The uterus turns blue or purple, loses contractility, and may require a hysterectomy. Um, also, renal failure and pituitary necrosis can result from ischemia. Um, usually, <coughs> maternal hypertension is the most common cause. Um, also, cocaine use, blunt external abdominal trauma, such as in um, maternal battering or a motor, motor vehicle accident. Also, smoking, history of a previous abruption, um, preterm um, rupture of membranes, multiple gestation, and um, sudden changes in intrauterine pressure, so uh, an amniotomy or, again, rupture of membranes. Lab testing is done, CBC, fibrinogen, PT, APTT, type and cross match, um, non-stress test, biophysical profile. 
An ultrasound is not useful for definitive diagnosis um, because the clot is, you, you basically cannot see it um, in greater than 50% of cases. Um, a CT is actually more reliable. Um, diagnosis is also confirmed after birth by visual inspection of that placenta. That's one of the biggest reasons that you want to make sure to look at that placenta um, because there may be some left inside. Um, initial assessment is much like for previa. Um, you're going to see pain, uterine tenderness, contractions, increased bundle height, abnormal fetal heart rate pattern, elevated resting tone and coagulopathy. Uh, therapeutic management depends on the severity of blood loss, also the fetal maturity and status. If they're term or if they're bleeding moderate to severe, um, we're going to go ahead and deliver. Labor may be induced if the separation is mild and gestation is near term. If it's less than 34 weeks and patient and fetus are stable, a vaginal birth is feasible and desirable, especially if, um, if at all possible. And hospitalization with close observation. Absolute bed rest. So active management would be immediate birth by C-section if fetal distress or other complications should not, it should not be done if um, she has severe and uncorrected coagulopathy because this can result in uncontrolled bleeding. Um, corticosteroids uh, given if needed, Rogam if the mom is Rh negative, large bore IV line, at least one but it's smart to have two, um, and continuous monitoring, also a fully cath um, and labs. So here's a picture. Um, this is basically a clot uh, that you can see after that placenta has been um, delivered. Nursing management, we're going to make sure there's strict bed rest, make sure she is laying in her left lateral position, um, that's going to increase tissue perfusion, possible oxygen therapy if needed, fully catheter because she is going to be on bed rest, um, IV normal saline or lactated ringers to combat hypovolemia, um, possibly um, checking that fundal height and abdominal girth, possibly hourly, um, and it's marked on her abdomen because the increase in size can indicate bleeding. Um, signs and symptoms of DIC is monitored, such as bleeding gums, tachycardia, oozing, petechia, um, uterine tone and tenderness and contractions. The fetus may not survive or they may need NICU. Um, so that's you need to make sure that you're giving her a lot of support because it's hard to send your baby to the NICU. Placenta accreta. The placenta actually attaches itself too deeply into the wall of the uterus, um, but it does not penetrate the uterine muscle. Uh, the placenta increta actually invades the myometrium and placenta percreta, uh, that placenta extends through the myometrium and uterine serosa and adjacent tissue. Um, common risk associated with placenta accreta um, when unsuspected at the time of birth is the possibility of hemorrhaging during manual attempts to detach the placenta. It occurs in as many as one in 272 pregnancies. Um, the cause is unknown, but can be related to placenta previa advanced maternal age, multiparity, in vitro fertilization, smoking, previous C-sections, and previous uterine surgery. 90% of accretas will experience a postpartum hemorrhage. 50%, yes, 50% will result in a hysterectomy. So early diagnosis and counseling um, is preferred uh, regarding possible C-section and hysterectomy. Hyperemesis gravidarum. Um, this is a severe form of nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. 
usually will result in dehydration, weight loss, electrolyte imbalance, and the need for hospitalization. This is a complication of pregnancy. It usually begins in the first trimester, usually before nine weeks. Um, it'll cause dehydration, ketosis, um, weight loss of more than 5% of pre-pregnancy body weight. Usually it peaks at 8 to 12 weeks and resolves by 20 weeks. Um, it can decrease the placental blood flow, decrease maternal blood flow, um, acidosis will threaten the mother and the baby's health, dehydration can lead to preterm labor. Um, risk factors uh, include previous hyperemesis, molar pregnancies, history of helicobacter pylori infection, multiple gestation, pre-pregnancy history of genitourinary disorders, hyperthyroid disorders, and pre-pregnancy psychiatric diagnosis. Causes are usually unknown, um, but usually the HCG levels are higher and they extend beyond the first trimester. Um, the endocrine theory, so the high levels of the HCG and estrogen um, during pregnancy, also the metabolic therapy, uh, theory, theory, um, so possibly vitamin B6 deficiency, and also there is a psychological theory that stress will increase the symptoms. Um, <clears throat> complications, esophageal rupture, uh, deficiencies of vitamin K and thiamine, which can result in Wernicke's encephalopathy. Also small for gestational age, low birth weight, prematurity, and five minute APGAR scores less than seven. Uh, Wernicke's encephalopathy is the presence of neurological symptoms that are caused by biochemical lesions in the central nervous system after exhaustion of B vitamin reserves, in particular thiamine or vitamin B1. Um, confusion and loss of mental activity that can progress to coma and death. Uh, loss of muscle coordination um, that can cause leg tremor. Visual changes such as abnormal eye movements, back and forth movements called nystagmus, double vision, eyelid drooping. Um, so treatment, usually they are going to be on a bland diet at home, preferably, um, or on clear liquids. Make sure they are having, they're doing a GI rest, so rest that stomach. Um, upon admission to hospital, she's going to have blood tests, um, usually normal saline uh, to prevent hyponatremia along with vitamins, so probably a banana bag with electrolytes added. Oral food and fluid are withheld for the first 24 to 36 hours, again, to let that GI tract rest. Um, if she does not improve after several days of bed rest and the other treatments, uh, she may need TPN or total parenteral nutrition, which is a feeding through a, a peg tube or percutaneous endoscopy gastrostomy. Diclegis is the first line therapy. This is pyridoxine and doxyalamin. Doxyalamin actually is um, sleep aid, so you can't really take it during the day. Try it, don't work. Um, but it's it's a, it's vitamin B6 and uh, sleep aid. It's very expensive, so um, you may be teaching mom to go uh, get sleep aid and vitamin B6 and take it together. A second line um, treatment includes dimenhydrinate, dramamine, diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl, and promethazine, which is Phenergan. If these fail, um, you can give Odansetron, which is Zofran. Also, other therapies include acupressure, hypnosis, massage, therapeutic touch, ginger, and wearing C-bands. I'm telling you, some people literally, like, that's, those C-bands are like life. So treatment for nausea and vomiting, this is just a little, cool little thing. Um, avoid strong flavors, perfumes or strong odors, because that can cause um, nerve stimulation. So um, avoid tight waistbands. Encourage her to eat small, frequent meals throughout the day. Separate solids and fluids by consuming fluids between meals and not during meals. 
Do not lie down or recline for at least two hours after eating. Use high protein supplemental drinks. Avoid foods high in fat. Increase the intake of carbonated beverages because that seems to calm the stomach down. Increase her exposure to fresh air. Also encourage her to eat when she is hungry, regardless of normal meal times. Um, drinking herbal teas with peppermint or ginger is also good. Um, avoid fatigue and learn how to manage stress. Schedule daily rest periods um, and to settle the stomach, eat dry crackers, toast, or soda before getting out of the bed. Clinical manifestations, she will have dry mucous membranes, poor skin turgor, um, decreased blood pressure, increased pulse rate, inability to tolerate PO fluids. Um, she may have electrolyte imbalances, um, may be in alkalosis from loss of the hydrochloric acid in the gastric fluids. So immediate assessment, urine dipstick, liver enzymes, CBC, urine ketones, um, which a lot of times are present, BUN, uh, urine specific gravity, um, make sure she's NPO, GRS, IV fluids, uh, anti-emetic, and electrolyte replacement. Anti-emetics given, um, promethazine, which is Finergan, prochlorpyrazine, which is Compazine, on Dancitron, which is Zofran, vitamin B6 or pyridoxine, metoclopramide or Reglan, enteral or parenteral nutrition. Um, encourage NPO, promote rest, um, encourage stress reduction techniques, assess for signs and symptoms of complications such as metabolic acidosis. Uh, jaundice, hemorrhage, nausea, retching without vomiting, and clearly vomiting. Um, need calm, compassionate, and sympathetic care. Um, it can be very debilitating and stressful. Uh, irritability, tearfulness, and mood changes are usually consistent with this, but the fetal well-being is the primary concern. Hypertension is the most common medical condition in pregnancy, complicating up to 10% of all pregnancies. These are among the leading causes of maternal mortality, along with thromboembolism, hemorrhage, and injuries. Um, worldwide, between 80 and 120 women with a pregnancy complicated by hypertension die daily. Uh, hypertensive disorders and pregnancy are also associated with long-term cardiovascular risks and diabetes in women. So increasing that morbidity of those women. Um, gestational hypertension is usually present for the first time during pregnancy. Blood pressure elevation to 140 over 90 is ID'd on at least two occasions, at least six hours apart after 20 weeks without protein in the urine. It usually returns to normal 12 weeks postpartum. Um, a temporary diagnosis for those not meeting chronic or preeclampsia criteria if the diagnosis is before 35 weeks, it is more likely to progress to preeclampsia. Now, preeclampsia is the most common hypertensive disorder of pregnancy. Um, it develops with proteinuria, or protein in the urine, after 20 weeks. Um, it's classified as mild, moderate, or severe. It targets the cardiovascular, hepatic, renal, and central nervous systems. Etiology remains a mystery. Um, Use of aspirin, magnesium, zinc, calcium, antioxidants, vitamin C and E, salt restriction, diet therapy, or fish oils have not been proved to prevent this condition. Um, however, aspirin is a good thing to still take, um, but that was one of the things that pretty much everybody used to take to prevent it. 
um, just basically be prepared. Um, it, it, it will increase the risk of preterm birth, placental abruption, intrauterine growth restriction, and fetal distress. Eclampsia is the onset of seizure activity in a woman with preeclampsia. So this is a bad, bad thing. Eclampsia is terrible. Chronic hypertension is pre-existing or develops before 20 weeks. Blood pressure exceeds 140 over 90 before pregnancy. 25% of these women will develop preeclampsia. Um, if it's mild, no drug treatment, um, it, and usually it doesn't decrease the risk of developing preeclampsia. If the blood pressure is greater than 160 over 100, absolutely they're going to need to be on um, antihypertensives. Also, simple changes in lifestyle may be helpful, um, influencing the pregnancy outcome positivity. Chronic hypertension um, with superimposed preeclampsia occurs in 20% of pregnant women with increased maternal and fetal morbidity. <clears throat> so, mild preeclampsia management, bed rest, daily monitoring of blood pressure, um, and fetal movement counts. Um, she might need to be hospitalized. She might need to have IV magnesium during labor. Now, severe preeclampsia management, uh, hospitalization, oxytocin, and magnesium, and preparation for birth. Um, actually, Titus was taken at 37 weeks because I had preeclampsia. Eclampsia management, um, seizure management, magnesium sulfate, antihypertensive agents, and birth once those seizures are controlled. Um, mild gestational hypertension can be managed at home. If mom is compliant, which is a big deal, and has good understanding of the disease, she's stable, the labs are not abnormal, and there, she's got plenty of fetal movement. Um, this continues until the fetus is mature. Um, now protein and hypertension occur without a woman's awareness. So be on the lookout for subjective complaints such as visual changes, severe headaches, unusual bleeding, bruising, or epigastric pain, altered level of consciousness, and irritability. Most of the time, these moms have to do a 24-hour urine collection. I had to do one twice a week. It was a train wreck. Um, administer mag sulfate to prevent seizures. Um, Magnesium is a CNS depressant that causes relaxation of smooth muscle and decreased arteriolar spasms, uh, which results in decreased irritability of the brain. This helps to prevent seizures and usually results in increased perfusion to the organs. Also, you're going to be assessing deep tissue reflexes to evaluate therapy. Signs of magnesium toxicity are respirations less than 12, absent deep tissue reflexes, decreased urine output less than 30 milliliters per hour. Um, serum mag levels need to be between 4 and 7, that's therapeutic. More than 8 is considered toxic. Um, calcium gluconate is the antidote for magnesium overdose or toxicity. Um, and you are going to evaluate for signs of labor, fetal distress, administer glucocorticoids to mature fetal lungs to um, basically prepare for the baby to be born early. Complications of gestational hypertension. Um, DIC, hepatic failure, renal failure, cerebral hemorrhage or CVA, uh, retinal detachment, intrauterine growth restriction, 
um, small for gestational age, secondary to fetal hypoxia and malnutrition. That is caused by maternal vasospasms and hypovolemia. Also death, maternal and fetal demise. So to lower the blood pressure, um, mom will be given hydralazine, labetalol, or nifedipine. This is indicated um, when systolic blood pressure is greater than 160 or diastolic is greater than 110. Um, this, is, this is given in order to maintain uteroplacental perfusion. Um, and you don't need to lower that pressure too rapidly. Um, to prevent convulsions, mag sulfate, um, definitely the steroids. Um, birth may be delayed up to 96 hours. Uh, usually they are unable to tolerate excessive postpartum blood loss because of the hemoconcentration. Oxytocin or prostaglandin products are used to control bleeding. Um, methergine is contraindicated because of the increase of blood pressure in these ladies. If seizures develop, turn her on her side. Um, if possible, document the time and sequence of events, provide oxygen afterward, monitor the fetus, um, pad them side rails, dim the lights, keep the room quiet, um, have suction there as necessary, continue magnesium, um, and again, prepare for birth. Uh, continue to monitor for at least 48 hours after delivery. Magnesium is given for 24 hours after delivery. Um, diuresis is a positive sign. You want her to be peeing plenty. Um, almost one third of those patients who seize do so after delivery. Um, and almost always in the first 48 hours. So you're gonna assess her level of consciousness, hyperreflexia, persistent headache, right upper quadrant epigastric pain. Um, it can appear suddenly in a seemingly stable patient. Um, respirations are halted and then uh, begin again with long, deep, stertuous inhalations. Then hypotension follows, muscular twitching, disorientation, and amnesia. Um, so eclampsia alone is not an indication for immediate C-section. However, um, we need to be monitoring mom and baby, and C-section may have to be done, um, or induction of labor, depending on the stability of mom and baby. HELP syndrome, um, it's a life-threatening obstetric complication. It is more common in the Caucasian women, also in older multiparous women. The hemolysis that occurs is termed microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. Um, it can present prior to the presence of an elevated blood pressure. So those red blood cells are destroyed um, they pass through those small damaged blood vessels. The liver enzymes are then elevated, um, reduce, uh, resulting of reduced blood flow to the liver, which also obstructs the formation of fibrin. So blood will be very, very thin. Um, blood pressure will go up. Uh, she's usually given hydralazine or labetalol. Um, magnesium to prevent convulsions, steroids, of course, to increase fetal low maturity. Um, early diagnosis is critical to prevent liver distension and rupture. Sh make sure you're checking reflexes. So if there's, um, she may have diminished or absent reflexes. Um, Liver uh, hematoma can happen, stroke, cardiac arrest. Um, with this particular uh, condition, if you think about it, with them low platelets, mom is not going to be able to have an epidural. So that's another thing that um, scares a lot of women. She will be stressed, freaking out, thinking she's not going to be able to handle that um but it is it i mean you, you can't 
you can't give an epidural. You can't be sticking needles into a spine when, you know, she could bleed out. So that is definitely, um, definitely a train wreck. ABO incompatibility. Um, mother is type O and baby A or B. Um, mother serum has naturally occurring anti-A and anti-B. So there's all kinds of different ways, but um, it, it happens, it does. It is less severe than RH incompatibility. So um, with the RH incompatibility, basically um, hemolysis occurs, the destruction of red blood cells. Basically, this is the this is the best picture that I've seen so far to explain. So first exposure, RH negative mom, whatever. The fetus is RH positive. So mom's immune system recognizes that new antigen is not self, doesn't look familiar, looks like a trespasser. Um, mom's blood cells produces IgM antibodies. Um, which does not cross the placenta, so the first baby is safe, okay? First baby is safe. It's the second that's, that's terrible. So mom has to have Rogam. Um, the, um, the antibodies in the second pregnancy, um, basically mom's immune system has created those antibodies it can cause fetal heart problems, breathing difficulties, jaundice, and hemolytic an an anemia um, in the newborn. Um, and 4,000 infants are still annually affected with this disease. 85% of babies in the USA are RH positive. Just FYI. Second exposure, again, um, it takes less than one milliliter of RH positive blood to result in sensitization, sensitization um, on the RH negative woman. Then it takes about a month for those RH antibodies and the maternal circulation to cross over into the fetal circulation. If it occurs during delivery, there is not enough time to produce a significant IgG response. Um, the risk and severity will increase with each subsequent pregnancy. Um, and basically she is given uh, the Rogam and the standard dose is 300 micrograms, which is effective for 15 milliliters of fetal red blood cells helping to destroy those before sensitization occurs. Um, this is one of the biggest reasons that you need to stress early prenatal care because moms are not thinking about the RH positive or the AVO incompatibility. Hydramnios is basically when there is a ton of amniotic fluid it's greater than 2,000. Um, it's caused uh, by too much fluid produced. Fluid is not taken up. Um, diagnosed when uh, between 32 and 36 weeks, there's greater than 200,000 milliliters. So assessment findings, um, mom will have an increase of abdominal size out of proportion for her weight gain and gestational age. Um, she'll have shiny skin with striae, dyspnea and chest heaviness, edema, um, possible abdominal pain, uh, dyspnea, edema. Um, you may hear a faint fetal heart sound um, due to all that fluid. Um, an ultrasound is done to measure those fluid pockets. Now, over distension will increase the risk of premature rupture of membranes and premature labor because all that fluid. Um, fetuses with polyhydramnios are at risk for premature birth 
fetal malpresentation because they have all kinds of fluid to be moving around in, cord prolapse, which is huge, abruption, and perinatal death. At delivery, the baby also should be choked for congenital abnormalities. Um, she might need a possible therapeutic amniocentesis as well. Oligo hydramnios is when the amniotic fluid is less than 500 um, between 32 and 36 weeks. This will arise from any condition that prevents the fetus from making urine or blocks it from going into the amniotic sac. Um, they are at increased risk for cord compression, fetal muscle and lung development. Um, if fetal well-being is compromised, um, Definitely, if um, you're going to watch mom, you're going to watch baby, but if they're being compromised, then immediate birth um, or amnio infusion, um, it's where they actually put the fluid, uh, crystalloid fluid, to replace that fluid. Um, usually that is normal saline um, or D5 half normal saline or uh, lactated ringers. Multiple gestation, so that's when we have plenty of churins in there. So twins, triplets, etc. cetera. Um, so monozygotic, um, this is identical twins, the single fertilized egg splits in the first two weeks. The dizygotic, these are fraternal. So two sperm fertilize two different ovas, separate amnions, chorions, and placentas. Um, ultrasound machine needs to be readily available um, to determine fetal position by the physician, fetal position by the physician while in delivery. Um, Rupture of membranes should be postponed until the mother is experiencing contractions. Um, this is going to lessen the risk of a pro prolapse cord. Uh, external fetal monitoring should continue through the entire passage of twin B. Um, an internal fetal electrode can be placed once that rupture of membranes happens. Um, and also preparing for a double setup in the operating room in the event a C-section is indicated. A woman carrying twins has unique nutritional needs, especially for additional calories. Um, the patient often experiences early satiety and loss of appetite because um, she's full of baby. Zzz. So, um, you may need to recommend consulting a nutritionist to address this and other issues. She has to increase her daily dietary intake by about 600 calories per day. Um, that is 300 calories more than a woman carrying a singleton gestation. Um, women carrying twins are at increased risk of developing anemia. Um, so 30 milligrams of iron is recommended during the first trimester. Um, and then 60 milligrams of iron until delivery, as well as one milligram of folic acid. Um, staying active is important for health, but may need to avoid strenuous exercise. Low impact exercise, such as swimming, prenatal yoga, and walking, um, aiming for about 30 minutes a day. Um, if there are any problems arising during pregnancy, um, it may be recommended that exercise be avoided. Premature rupture of membranes. Um, that means the water breaks before labor starts. Fluid starts leaking. She'll have vaginal discharge, possible vaginal bleeding, pelvic pressure, and usually no contractions. Um, it is diagnosed by nitrosine strips, um, vaginal exam, um, risk factors of premature rupture of membranes, infection, prolapsed cord, abrupt EO placenta, multiple gestation, low BMI, tobacco use, 
previa, UTI, vaginal bleeding anytime, and low socioeconomic, socioeconomic status. Um, also, a short interval uh, between pregnancies increases her risk of this. So with nursing management, no unsterile digital exam done until active labor. Um, induction, if, induction of labor if the fetal lungs are mature. Um, this is not a lone indicator for surgical birth, um, but more than likely mom's going to get corticosteroids and antibiotics, number one, to prevent infection, but also to um, help mature those lungs. Um, evaluate fetal uh, heart rate continuously. Um, and at 24 hours after those membranes have ruptured, we start moving into uh, infection territory. So um, just a lot of education is needed. Is the following statement true or false? Most first trimester spontaneous abortions result from maternal conditions. Um, this is false. Fetal genetic abnormalities are the most common cause of first trimester abortions. Um, second and third are usually maternal. Which finding would the nurse expect to assess in a woman with placenta previa? The answer is D, relaxed uterus. The woman with placenta previa would exhibit a soft, relaxed uterus accompanied by painless, bright red vaginal bleeding that stops spontaneously only to recur. Um, Abruptio placentae is associated with dark red vaginal bleeding, uterine tenderness, and fetal distress. Is the following statement true or false? The onset of seizures indicates severe preeclampsia. False. Seizures denote the onset of eclampsia. If you have any questions, let me know.